So we're going to read uh, from Genesis chapter 50, uh, just from verse 22 to the end. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 22. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived for 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring, uh, bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Ab Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Let's pray. Lord, as we uh, come to your word again, we are conscious as we close this book, and uh, Lord, we begin to look back on it. We pray that you would uh, make things stand out in our minds that you want us to remember. And please, Lord, deal with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the book of Genesis in Hebrew, not that I'm a Hebrew scholar, I'll have to say it in uh, syllables because I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it. The way, the way uh, Genesis is, is in Hebrew is Bere, sorry, Bereshit. I think the T is pronounced separately from the sounds of it or has some special pronunciation. Um, Bereshit. And it just means... In the beginning. So the, the word Genesis just means in the beginning. And it's exactly the same word that if you open the book of Genesis, the first word that you would read is Bereshit, because it's in the beginning. That's how the book starts. In the beginning. The book is a book of beginnings. It's a foundation, you might say, for the whole of the Bible. In fact, if you went on our website, I don't know if you ever, ever go on our website, I guess not, but if, if you're re regularly, you probably don't, but you can go on our website and uh, you'll find there that the sermons, um, so we're now doing them on the video, but they're also on, in audio on the, on the website. And this series I called Foundations. So all of the, all of the uh, 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 sermons are called, uh, under this title, Foundations. And during the week, earlier on in the week, I was walking the dog um, over through these uh, new houses that are being built on Hummersey Hills. And of course, um, some of them look like ready to be lived in. Uh, some of them are in various states of build. But there are some where there's just still like foundations, a couple of feet of wall, and just a concrete slab. And I noticed that a couple of them that like that, right up near Hummersey School, had a great big crack across the, the slab, the concrete slab, that was the base. Here in Genesis 50, the foundations are being laid, and the foundation is solid. The foundation is sure. that The, the, the foundation doesn't have cracks. And the rest of the Bible builds on the foundation of this book. And so as we move on, I just want to look back at this foundation that's been laid for us. We, we, we've moved from this perfect creation where humans were the pinnacle of God's creation through sin in the garden. Remember when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit they weren't allowed to eat? And then we saw not just them being cursed, but we saw the decline of mankind turning away from God. And uh, it got to the point in the end, didn't it, where God had to flood the earth. He saw how wicked everyone was and he said, that's enough. And he just saved eight of them in that boat and he destroyed the world. And then uh, we move on and we, we, uh, yeah, we get the, the Tower of Babel where, again, people were in sin trying to, um, and pride trying to do marvelous things and, and God said, oh, we're going to need to split them up and spread their languages. And then we get this wonderful account of this amazing family of Abraham starting with Abraham and God's promises to him. You remember, he, he gave him a promise that he was going to be, be, be a, like his family would become a nation, that they would have a land, and that God would bless them and they would bless others. 
And then we begin to read about that fulfillment as that, as that promise is passed on from Abraham. And then we, we find God making a promise to his son, Isaac, and then to Jacob, and then beyond. And so the question we're asking ourselves is, what is the legacy? What, what hangs behind? After we've read Genesis, what are the things that are, are still in place as we move on to the rest of the Bible? Or, or another way of putting at it, what is it that Joseph leave, leaves behind that really matters? Now, is it straight, straight, is it these few verses cover probably half of Joseph's life. Someone who's uh, cleverer than I worked out that it, uh, he was probably in his mid-50s when Jacob died. So when his father died, he was probably in his mid-50s, and he dies when he's 110. So he's got another 55 years to go, and it's all summarized in just these few verses. So how does uh, Moses, who's writing this book, summarize the rest of Joseph's life? What, what is it that, that stays? What is it that we could sum up? What is it that we could hold on to and, uh, and take with us as we move on? And before we say what he does leave, it's really interesting what he doesn't say. Let's look at those verses again. It doesn't say anything about Joseph's position. It doesn't say anything about what happened to him and his position with Pharaoh. It doesn't say how that was passed on to someone else or how he retired. It doesn't say anything about his wealth. It doesn't say anything about his, his position and status in society. It doesn't say anything about those things. Because they, they would all be cracked foundations to build upon, wouldn't they? Once he's died, that, that's all gone. His status, his wealth, to some extent, has gone. His fame. And as we think about this, I just want to ask you to think about what legacy you're going to leave. We've, we've, we've thought about death quite a lot in the last few weeks, haven't we? And I just want you to reflect a little bit about what, what you're going to leave behind. <clears throat> what, what are the important things that you want to have passed on to others? Are you, going to, are you going to leave others something solid to build upon? If they remember you, what are they going to remember you for? Or are we going to leave something that's weak and cracked? What, what about this church, the life of this church? What, when we're all gone, whenever that is, we're all gone, and wherever the building is and whatever's happening, the, the pe people of God that are meeting here, here in Loftus somewhere in the building or somewhere else, what, 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 is the, what is the legacy that we're handing on? <clears throat> and today I just want to say two things about Joseph and this legacy that he's left. And the first thing I want to say is left a family. A family. Verses 22 and 23. It would be easy to overlook um, verse 23. But let's just pause for a moment and think about the blessings of this sort of multi-generational family. Now, I don't want to be insensitive because I know there's people here, many people here actually, who have not had children and for some, that's a real burden uh, that they bear, or not had, or cannot or have not, for whatever reason, had children. But also, I don't want to avoid the fact that Joseph clearly sees his family as a blessing. And of course, we are all part of a family. We might not have had our own children, but we're all part of a family. And his epitaph here in these few verses mentions holding great, great, grandchildren on his knee. In fact, there might be a great missing out there. I'm not quite sure. But, but, but he's holding these little ones on his knee. It doesn't talk about his national leadership. It doesn't talk about his great position in this great uh, uh, land of Egypt. It talks about him and his family with little children sat on his knee. And, and surely there's something here that it is a theme in the book. We're, we're, we're reading about a family, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. We're reading about a family and the blessings that there are in a family. Families surely are a blessing from God. Yes, they're hard work. Yes, they bring much pain and anguish. 
Yes, they bring stresses and strain. And some of those stresses and strains, you can find them in the book here, in Genesis. Yes, families teach us so much about God and about ourselves. But for most of us, a family is one of the things that we'll leave behind when we die. So let's cherish family life. Let's commit to supporting family life. Something that should come above career and wealth and status and fame. Let's invest our energies as well as our words in family life. And it might be that you might say, well, I haven't got a child to do that with, but you've got other children that are around you. And particularly in the church, we've got like a, a church family where you can invest your energies in the next generation. No doubt there'll be children near where you live that you might be able to have some role in their lives. Let's make sure that we're speaking up for the family in the life of this country. You know, the, the devil does not like families. The devil does not like marriages that last. He does not like relationships that strengthen society. He wants to kill and destroy and steal. He's not in the business of supporting families, and so we need to be people that are. We need to be God's speak, people, willing to speak up for the blessings of family life. And perhaps there are times when we need to write to our MP about something. Perhaps there are times when we need to speak up to our friends about something that just shows that we value family life, just like God values family life. I don't know if you know, but last year there was a thing going on in Scotland <coughs> called the Scottish Name Persons Scheme. I thank the Lord it was defeated. But there was to be a, a representative of the state for every single child in Scotland who was to stand up for their rights and to look, look out for that child. And, and it just seemed to me a terrible undermining of what God has given us for responsibility for parents. And thankfully it was stopped. We need to think about the way that some ungodly ideologies, let's just call them that, un, ungodly ideologies are normalised in schools, some schools today. The devil does all that he can to disrupt and destroy families. Some of us have even known some of the pain of that ourselves. God doesn't, the devil doesn't like it. They're God's idea. The family is God's idea, and he knows it's good. God, God knows it's good, and the devil wants to destroy it. So, like Joseph, let's aim to leave behind the legacy of a united, godly family. We need to be careful that family is not our highest agenda because clearly God is our highest agenda and we want to worship him and we'll be thinking about that in a moment. But clearly there's a value to family that's represented here in Genesis that we need to take seriously. And children, remember, remember your part in this too. I want, we want you to know that you're a blessing and not a curse. We want you to know that it's a joy. We love having children around in the church. We love having ch children in our home. We love sharing everything with children. But remember too that you have a role to play in supporting and encouraging family. That, that you need to love your brothers and sisters. You need to love your mum and dad. And the Bible tells you to submit and to obey your mum and dad. And so as godly families, we can show the world what families can be like, what God wants families to be like. So remember, children, that you've got a part to play as well. So family is the first thing I wanted to mention. And faith is the second thing. Faith. What, what's the other thing? What's the other legacy that, that is left? 
And in so many ways, a much greater legacy, a wonderful legacy of faith. He left the family, but he left them stuff to believe. He had a faith that he wanted them to share. He wanted his family to share and wanted others to share. It's not an automatic thing that because parents believe in God and trust in the Lord Jesus, that the children will, or that the next generation will. It's interesting, isn't it? If you, if you notice the phrase in verse 24, it says, And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God. I'm just going to stop there. I am about to die, but God. Just leave the dots just for a minute. I'm about to die, but God. And, and again, I, I said we've spoken about death quite a lot, haven't we? But doesn't that just sum it up? I am about to die, but God. God. But God has done something. But God has promised something. But I trust him. I am about to die, but God. I don't know when that time's going to come, and even if we'll get a chance to think like this, because some people don't get a chance to think like this before they die, but some of us will. We'll lie on a deathbed and we'll we'll be thinking, I'm about to die, but God, I hope that's what you'll be thinking, but God. You see, without God, death is terrifying. Without without God, it is terrifying. If you can't say about death, but God, then you need to be afraid. Don't spare any time or effort. Don't even sleep until you understand what God has done that means that you can know God and that you can know that he's won a victory over death and a victory over your sin and that he has conquered the judgment that you deserve and that you can go and be with him forever. If you don't know that for yourself, if you haven't put your trust in the Lord Jesus in that way, If you're looking at death and it just terrifies you and you can't say, but God, then don't sleep, don't do anything until you've found out what that is that you can do that can give you that reassurance. Because that's one of the wonderful things that we've read as we've read of these various folk that have died in the last few chapters is to see that there is a but God when someone dies. Joseph wants to encourage his brothers. He he calls his brothers to him. Another part of his family. He's not so much the children now. He's thinking about his brothers. And he wants to encourage them that God will keep his promise. It says, isn't it? "I, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. He's saying we have a covenant keeping God, a God who's true to his word. He has said he will do it, and he will do it. I might be dying, but you're going to go, or your children, the descendants that we've brought into this world, are going to be delivered, just as God has said. Now, Joseph didn't know everything that was coming, but he did know that God had promised some things, and he was willing to stand upon it and hold on to it firmly. And as we read about this, does it not thrill you to think what you can pass on, what you can tell others to believe? That when you're gone, the legacy that you can leave will be that you told them about this truth. So, so yes, we can, we can also vouch for the fact that God did swear a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and that he was going to give them a land, and he has indeed done that. And many more prophecies from the Old Testament have been fulfilled. And in fact, we see not just these physical blessings of Abraham's physical, the physical land of Israel, not, not just the blessings upon them, not just the, the, the way that they would uh, proceed in God's plans, but also that they were pointing towards a greater home, a greater spiritual promise, 
a, a, a spiritual city that all those who trust in Christ would enter into. In other words, we can know the spiritual blessings that were the fullness of this promise that as yet hasn't been explained. What a, what a wonderful legacy to leave that we can tell our children and our children's children and anyone else that will listen the wonderful promises of God and what he is yet to do. And one of the things, of course, today we can say is that he's coming back. Get ready. He's coming back. We need to be ready. We need to, we need to have submitted to Jesus. We need to have trusted him. We need to be ready for the day where he comes back because he's going to come back as judge and king. You know, when we know Jesus as Saviour and Lord, we can look at death and say, but God, he's provided for my eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. So death itself, yes, it's still an enemy, but it will be, uh, God will give us a victory over it and we will be with him uh, forever. I wonder what legacy of faith you will leave, leave. I spoke already, I suppose, about a legacy of family, but I wonder what, what legacy of faith you will leave. I wonder what's going on in your heart as you think about this. Perhaps there's children that you've got that aren't believers and it just fills you with a passion to pray for them. Let's be praying for one another's children that don't know the Lord. Let's cry out to God together that we might leave this, this, this wonderful legacy to our children that they might know God as well. Let's be people who die trusting God's promises and are encouraging our family to do the same. Not only does Joseph believe that God will visit them and bring them to the promised land, he wants his brothers to believe it too, and he wants them to act. Did you notice that in verse 25? He is specifically saying to them, I want you, and he's asking them to swear that they'll do it, I want you to carry up my bones. When it happens, not if it happens, but when God fulfills his promise and he takes us back to the promised land, when he goes, take my bones with me. He's saying to his family, and of course it was several hundred years later, so we're talking about his brother's children's children's children. He's saying to them, it's going to happen, and when it happens, I want my bones to go back too. He's sort of leave, yes, he's leaving the legacy of his family. He's leaving a legacy of faith, but part of that is he's leaving his bones. And he's saying to them, I've got a job for you to do. I want you to, to act. I want you to act upon this. And it's a reminder, children, that you need to respond for yourself. You need to decide to follow Jesus for yourself. It's not enough just to think that, well, mum and dad follow Jesus, so we're okay. I'm okay. No, you need to, as soon as you understand what you need to do, you need to put your faith and your trust in the hands of the Lord Jesus too. That your trust in him with your life and with your death. And he asks his brothers to make this oath. He wants them to make a solid commitment to carry his bones back to Canaan. Think about it for a moment what Joseph might have done. I think if I'm right with history, you can check this out, I'll be interested if you want to correct me, but I think we're only a few hundred years after the Great Pyramids were built. You know, perhaps, you know, he was, he was the, apart from Pharaoh, he was the highest person in Egypt. Perhaps, perhaps he could have had a, a little pyramid over him. Or perhaps at least had a very grand burial and a very grand burial site and he could have looked something quite special, couldn't he? He could have asked for a, 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 a reminder of himself. The legacy that he could have left would have been a great big burial pot, a great big pyramid or something that, that said to everyone, Joseph was great. But he didn't want that. The end of the book just talks about him being embalmed, which was so that his, uh, his body was preserved, and put in a coffin. It doesn't even mention him being buried. It's, being, it's waiting. The, the coffin is waiting for the day, hundreds of years later, 
when they move to the promised land and he's going to get carried and taken and buried there. He chose to be associated, like, like Moses later, he, he chose to be associated with his, God's people rather than to have the grandeur of a burial in Egypt. What was most important to him were the promises that God had given, <clears throat> that he trusted were going to happen in the future. It's interesting um, that Joseph gets a very brief mention in uh, the Hebrews uh, little list of those of faith, Hebrews 11. I don't know what it is about Hebrews when I try and find it quickly. It always disappears. <coughs> Come here, Hebrews 11. Verse 22. This is what it says. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. That's a summary of the faith of Joseph. That at the end of his life, what was in his heart and mind was that God was going to fulfill his promise to take them back to the promised land and that his bones had to go back with him. <clears throat> and sure enough, if you want to look it up, you'll find that in Exodus chapter 13 and verse 19 that Moses carried Joseph's bones out of Egypt. When they left and they went back towards the promised land, they took Joseph's bones with them. And then if you look up Joshua 24 and verse 32, you'll find that his bones were buried in Shechem, in the promised land. So the call from Joseph to his children and his children's children and his brother's children was to show faith in action, to believe that this was going to happen and to take his bones when they went. I wonder what the legacy that we will leave behind, whether we'll leave a family that have heard from us about the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether our family know about the promises of God and the things that are to come when the Lord Jesus returns. <clears throat> they know about how to be prepared and ready for that day when Jesus returns. I wonder what it is that's in your mind as we, let's say, drive away from this book as if it was our old house that we're moving from. I wonder what the things are that we're going to remember about this book. I think we've been reminded here about the preciousness of family and the preciousness of faith. And I hope and pray that we would hold on to these things, treasure the things that the Lord has given us as individuals and as a church as we seek to be his family here in this world. And this, this foundation that's been laid in Genesis prepares us for what's coming. It prepares us for a deliverance from Egypt through Moses in the book of Exodus. It prepares us for the conquest of the promised land in the book of Joshua. And it prepares us ultimately for Jesus, the deliverer the one that brings salvation to our souls. Let's, let's pray together and ask the Lord to confirm in our hearts the things that he wants us to remember and to treasure from this book. Let's pray. Lord God, as we have um, gone through the book of Genesis, this book of beginnings, we see all sorts of patterns and themes, so many things to consider. But Lord, we thank you today for just bringing before us these two things, the blessings of being family, your great plans in the world to strengthen society, to help us to pass on to our children something of the truths about God. We thank you for the privilege and joy that it is, and we pray you'd help us 
to do it. We pray that the children here would receive the things that they hear about God. Thank you for the things, not just that they hear here on a Sunday, but they hear from their parents. And Lord, what we treasure, we pray, might be the experience of more and more people. We think of all of the children here in Loftus and how few of them hear anything of the truth of the gospel. Give us a heart to tell them about you, we pray. And we do just pray for those children of people here who have gone their own way, who, who know the things of the Lord, but have gone their own way. We pray, Lord, that you would stop them in their tracks. We pray, Lord, that you would do whatever it takes to remind them of the truths of the gospel and to remind them of the most important things in life. And help them, we pray, to, to turn to you in faith today. Might you speak, might you challenge them, might you, might, might you stir their hearts towards you this day. And we do pray for something of the faith that Joseph had. Thank you, Lord, that he was able to hold on to your promises. He knew that they were sure and certain. And Lord, we pray that we might also be people who live and walk by faith and not by sight. That we would hold on to the unchangeable word of God. Whatever the world says, whatever we're being encouraged to do or think by the world, we pray you'd help us to hold firm and hold fast to your promises and to your word. Help us to believe that Jesus is coming back and we need to be ready. And Help us to spread that good news, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.